Welcome back to Tapestry. I'm Kyle. I'm one of the pastors here. And today we're continuing on in our series called Questioning Evangelism. And the hope is that we actually are dealing with the real questions, the real concerns that we have or may have about this practice of the Christian faith that you may or may not have heard you know, pastors like us talk about from time to time, or you may, not, may or may not have engaged in from time to time. But if, you are, if you're here this morning um, and you think that we're about to deal with a, a silly question, then you're in the right place. Because this morning we're going to deal with this question, is it immoral to evangelize? And, and you might think that's a silly question because it's obviously not. Or you might think it's a silly question because it obviously is. Regardless, you're in the right place. You're in the right place. I think it's going to be a meaningful topic to connect on. Let me pray for us before we get into our scripture passage today. God, thank you so much for the opportunity to listen. The opportunity to listen to you. Thank you that you are not a God who is silent or undiscoverable, but that you made yourself known in your word, that it's a place we can go and find you consistently. And God, I pray that each and every person in this room, whether we're in church again for the first time in a really long time or first time ever, or whether we've come so frequently, we're almost jaded to the message. God, would you meet us here? Would you speak a word to us that we need to hear, that we can understand? And God, I pray that you would speak through me. Would your spirit be poured through my personality? In Jesus' name, amen. So our text today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 17. And it's a fairly lengthy passage, but as I reminded a few people this morning, you know, it's only lengthy if you're only used to reading like two or three verses of the Bible at a time. But there's this other way of reading the Bible, which is like reading it like a book, or reading it like a novel, or reading it like a text, where you read huge chunks of it at a time. So compared to that, it's actually very short, okay? (laughs) But just get get ready, I'm gonna read it for us this morning. This is Acts 17, verses 16 through 34. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day, with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, by the way, the the Areopagus is what has been known in English as Mars Hill, because that's a literal translation of it. It's where the big discussions of like the city elites happened. They took him there. Where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we'd like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you're ignorant of, or you do not know, the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. 
from one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. And God did this so that they would seek and perhaps find and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from any one of us. And I quote, for in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Is it immoral to evangelize? If you're wondering what a good chunk of people in this room might think, you probably know what you think. It might be helpful to know that almost half of Christian millennials, as people in my generation, think that it is. They at least somewhat, almost 47, or 47%, according to a 2019 study of Christian people in my generation, somewhat agree with the statement, it is wrong to share your faith with someone of a different faith in hopes that they'll share your faith. And you might think that because I'm a pastor, that because it's my vocation to share my faith, that I might say, no, it's not wrong to evangelize. But you'd be wrong. If you asked me that same question, I would say, maybe. Maybe not. Depends on what you mean. If by evangelize you mean bag your quota of converts so you can tell your pastor you're a good Christian, yes, it's immoral. Because it cheapens and trivializes the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus to a a commodity that can be sold, complete with a multi-level marketing scheme and high-pressure sales. That is wrong from my point of view. But if you're asking, do I think it's inherently wrong, inherently wrong to share your faith with someone in the hopes that they would someday share your faith? I would say, no, I don't think that. I don't think that's wrong. Now, I realize that some right in this room and many folks listening online do think that, and I respect that. And and you may think that it's wrong in part because you have been on the receiving end of some pretty immoral evangelism efforts. Or you may think that because you've been on the giving end. Things that maybe you were kind of forced to do in childhood that now upon reflection you're like, that was messed up. But whatever the case may be, I want to give you enough credit. I want to take you seriously enough to, to... believe that if you say, yes, that's an immoral thing to do, that you have more behind that than one or two or ten bad experiences. Because I know that you know that evangelism, like anything else, can be done in all kinds of ways, some more off-putting than others. So I want to take you seriously enough to believe that you have principled reasons behind your objection to evangelism. Whether it started an experience and led you to those reasons, or whether it started with the reasons. And as best I can tell, there are basically two principled reasons, two main objections to evangelism. As best I can tell. 
And I'm going to call them the systemic critique and the interpersonal critique. The, the systemic critique goes something like this. Christian evangelism is inherently tied to a history of white European colonization. That colonization includes the destruction of peoples, homes, lands, culture, traditions, and even bodies in the name of saving their souls. But really, evangelism has always been a religious smokescreen for white European economic and cultural domination. I know it's a mouthful. That's why we put it on the screen. But here's something that I want to make sure you hear from a pastor of a Christian church this morning. This critique is partly true. It tells a true part of the story. I'll give you one example. Just last year, Pope Francis repudiated something called the Doctrine of Discovery. If you don't know what the Doctrine of Discovery is, it's a doctrine that's sort of compiled together from three papal bulls or decrees in the 1400s. Um, basically, among other things, the doctrine of discovery gave religious cover and even rights to European expansionists to steal the land of people they considered non-Christian. And of course, the corollary of that is that you should be able to subjugate those people or even enslave people in order to, quote-unquote, Christianize them or evangelize them. This doctrine is not just a Catholic doctrine. It's an American doctrine. It has made its way into our legal system. There are several Supreme Court decisions that reference the doctrine of discovery as legal precedent for land rights cases all the way up until 2005. And it's not just a Catholic thing, and it's just an American thing. It's also a Protestant Christian thing. We don't get out of this scot-free either. It's, whether or not it's an official doctrine of the church, it has formed the mindset of many Protestant slaveholders. If those two things could be put together. It's formed the practices, mostly in the 20th century, of Protestant mission agencies that have gone into places that were non-Western and in the name of Jesus tried to strip the language and culture out of a place in the name of the gospel. And as Christians, we have to be able to unequivocally say, not just that's wrong, not just that's immoral, but that is sinful before God. And an absolute degradation of the gospel of Jesus. And we have to repent. Not, I mean, even if, even if we are, haven't ever taken part in something quite so sinister as all the things that I described, the Bible sees us as part of a much larger community of people with responsibility for our people even if they don't even if they do things we wouldn't have done and so as a christian community it's important that we say this morning out loud we repent of of the doctrine of discovery and all of its effects however i would hate for us to in the name of repentance allow the colonizers to take one more thing. And that is this ancient Christian practice that did not belong to them to begin with and that they degraded and defaced called evangelism. Because you have to understand, if, if you actually believe the phrase to evangelize is to colonize, then you agree with the colonizers because that is exactly what they believed. To evangelize is to colonize. 
And let, let's not let the colonizers colonize evangelism. Okay, because, because that belief is not only wrong, it's, it's anti-historical, it's anti-biblical, it's racist. It, anti-historical and anti-biblical just from the standpoint of reading our text today, the story that we read. I want to point out something that's so basic to the story that sometimes we kind of just move right through it and past it to get to the point. But the setting of the story that we read today is a brown Jewish man named Paul from what is now eastern Turkey went to evangelize a group of Greek people in the capital of Greece in what became the capital of Western Proto-European thought. In other words, evangelism came from the East, not the West. It didn't come from Europe. It came to Europe. And by the way, long before the idea of Europe was even a real thing or the idea of whiteness was a sinful racial construct in society. So let's not let the colonizers do any more colonizing than it's already happened. Evangelism doesn't belong to them. That's the systemic critique. The, the interpersonal critique goes something like this. Someone might say, okay, fine. But still, on an interpersonal level, to love someone means to accept them as they are. And, and to accept them as they are means accepting their, their identity, their culture, their values, and yes, their beliefs. Evangelism is inherently unloving because it says that something about you needs to change. And that implies that you are not acceptable as you are. That is inherently unloving. Now again, I want to say there's a lot of truth in that critique. And the thing that I respect most about anyone who holds this critique of evangelism is the deep desire that all of our relationships would be filled with love and respect and that they would be filled with that not just in word but in deed. That you can't just say you love somebody and then treat them like garbage. You actually have to love them and the way that you relate to them. And yet, there are a few problems with this definition of love. And I'm only gonna, I only have time to talk to one of them today. But the, the first challenge, and the one I'm going to speak to in this moment, is the idea that to challenge someone's beliefs, whether explicitly or implicitly, just by sharing yours, is inherently unloving because they need to change. Because that means that you think they need to change. There's a problem with that idea, and the, and the problem with it is fundamentally that none of us actually believe it. None of us actually believe it. If we're honest, we look at the, the whole of our lives and the whole of the way that we relate to people. None of us actually believe that it is unloving to challenge someone's beliefs in the hopes that they will change. Here's what I mean. A family member of yours started believing QAnon conspiracy theories. Would it be unloving for you to respectfully, gently challenge them in hopes that they would change? If a friend of yours started believing that they were ugly and unworthy of love, would it be wrong of you to gently, in different ways, through word and actions, challenge that belief? Or if your spouse started to believe the idea that maybe an open marriage could bring some new life into this thing, would it be unloving of you? to challenge that belief in hopes that they would change their mind? I mean, maybe to any one of those things, you'd be like, no, I'm like, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm queuing on all the way, unworthy and loving the open marriage thing, you know? That'd be a really weird combination, but maybe that's you. If it is, you probably have your own beliefs that you would challenge somebody else on. I could go on for hours with a list like this. There was actually a, a story or an, an article that came out in Salon Magazine a couple years ago called Can We Save Loved Ones from Fox News? 
It's interesting religious terminology, right? And I'm not trying to make a political point here. You could insert MSNBC there if you want. The, the point is, this article was, it read almost like, um, like a 1980s evangelism seminar. Like, complete with all of these tips for how to win a soul away from the news source you don't like. Like, make someone feel comfortable with you. You know, establish common ground. Ask good questions. Uh, 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 find a moment to turn them toward the topic. And then share a personal story. The problem with the interpersonal critique is that none of us actually believe it when it comes to almost any other area of life. We selectively apply it specifically to faith. Why do we do that? Uh, there might be lots and lots of reasons. But maybe the answer is, at least in part, because even if the systemic critique doesn't hold, even if the interpersonal critique doesn't hold, we still know that evangelism can be very immoral. It can still be done in very immoral ways or from a very immoral place, an unloving place. And so what we need to learn from the Apostle Paul in Acts 17 today is how to share our faith in a loving moment, through a loving method, from a loving motivation. In a loving moment, with a loving method, and from a loving motivation. First of all, let's take a look at the loving moment. Paul says, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you don't even know the very thing that you worship. And this is what I'm coming to talk to you about. Paul takes time in Athens. He travels the city, not as a tourist, but as a careful spiritual observer. He cares enough about the place to look not just at the outs, not just at the, the trinkets that he's being sold, but at what they mean about the people of this place. He listens, he learns, and you know what he does too? He, he finds the good even in things that he's uncomfortable with. Paul is, and we're going to get to this part later, but he is, the Bible says, greatly distressed at the idol worship in Athens. As a Jewish person, as a Christian person, or, or at, at that point, he would just be as a Jewish person who was a follower of Jesus, he would be greatly distressed by that. But still somehow, Paul is able to let that exist and still see what that idol worship means about the longing inside of these folks that he's talking to. Man, I see you're very religious in every way. Like, look at all of these idols. You must really long for God. You must really be searching for God. In fact, you're searching so hard. Look, there is even an idol to an unknown God. Look at you willing to be honest about what you don't know. That's what I want to talk to you about. Paul is able to look for the good in the people that he's speaking with, first and foremost. And then he's able to look for the opening. Look for a genuine opening. And let me help you out with something. If you're out to lunch with some friends and one friend says, man, I really love the fish tacos at this place. Do not say, man, I hear you. And you know what I love? Jesus. Let me tell you about him. Like, that's not an opening. That's not an opening. I'm just going to help some of you right now. You're like, you need to go text a friend right now because that's not an opening. And, and the reason it's not is because they will not receive that as love. There's no way they could. I mean, you can't control how other people receive things, but there's no way they could. They will receive that as you needing to do something rather than you helping them with something they need from you. Paul sees a genuine opening here. They're like, we don't know. We don't know. And he's like, well, let me tell you, someone I know. One of the, one of the um, tools that 
churches and other nonprofits use to um, to engage with and help develop community um, and the resources in a community is called something uh, something called asset based community development. Uh, if you haven't heard of that before, it basically means that when you're when you're looking at a community and you're trying to dis- and you're trying to figure out how can we help uh, this community thrive, you could look at it from a deficit based way of thinking. What is this community lacking? What skills do they not have? What things do they need? What can, what can we import from outside? That's one way of doing it, but an asset-based approach is to say, no, 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 let's not start with deficit thinking. Let's start with asset-based thinking. What assets are in this community already? What gifts and talents and skill sets exist in this community already? How, how can we build together from there? And you might say that Paul, in our passage today, is actually exercising what what I might call asset-based spiritual development. He's saying, what assets are there in this community already that that help us to, to move forward, not from a place of deficit based thinking, but from a place of, wow, God has already planted something in you. You have to learn about a community to know those things. We'll we'll talk about more about that in just a second. But instead of the taco example, right? That's not a moment. That is not a loving moment. You might also experience something like this from time to time in your life. You might also experience a friend in a a particularly raw moment tell you that they've been cheating on their partner and that they just can't figure out what to do with the shame of it, the guilt of it. That might be a loving moment to share your faith. Or you might have a friend after an election where your party loses ask you, how in the world do you have, like, how can you have hope for a future when this party is in power? That might be a loving moment to share a reason for the hope that you have. Or when you're out for coffee and you share a deep personal story of your own pain and your own suffering, and a friend says, man, that is incredible. How did you make it through that? There might be a loving moment to share about what your faith in Jesus has done to hold you up through that suffering. Or, or, or when a friend says, well, my faith, my faith teaches the law of returns, that if I put something positive in the world, into the universe, the universe will give me positive things back. But I've got to be honest with you, I just can't square that right now with my mom getting cancer. What did she do to deserve that? Like, I don't think she put anything into the world that gave her that back. That might be a loving moment to share your faith. But picking a loving moment, picking a loving moment does not mean that you will use a loving method, right? And so that's where we got to really got to pay attention to Paul's asset-based spiritual development plan, right? Because Paul, he's not just willing to, to, to um, share his faith. He's willing to learn from the people that he's sharing with. He's genuinely willing to learn. You can see that by the fact that he doesn't quote a single scripture in his speech to the Areopagus. He doesn't quote a single one. First of all, they would have been like, what? This, we don't, we don't know this text. And if we did, it wouldn't have any weight in our lives. But second of all, I think Paul wanted to show them, look, Your culture, you don't have to jettison your Greek identity and culture wholesale in order to follow Jesus. The seeds of the gospel have already been planted in your culture. So he quotes two of their poets and philosophers when he says, for in him we live and move and have our being. That's a quote from the Cretan philosopher Epimenides. And when he says, we are his offspring, that's a quote from the Cilician Stoic philosopher Eratus. And apparently half the people there, according to the Bible, were Stoics, and so they would have particularly loved that one. And check this out. He doesn't quote them in order to just debunk them. He doesn't quote their people to tell them how they were wrong. 
he quotes their people to say, yeah, they were right. We might need to flesh this out a little bit more. But you don't have to jettison your history. You don't have to jettison your culture. You don't have to jettison your traditions or your, even your authorities necessarily in order to follow Jesus. You need to see how they will be fulfilled by following Jesus. So Paul, Paul actually can look at this Greek way of thinking and see the seeds of the gospel in it and share it. There's a, an author named C.S. Lewis who he was an atheist for many, many years up until his midlife, and he eventually became a Christian. He wrote this book called Mere Christianity, uh, which if you haven't read it, please read it. It's a very, very, very good book, an important book. Um, but he says this. He says, from his own experience, if you are a Christian, you do not have to believe that all the other religions are simply wrong all through. You don't. If you're an atheist, you do have to believe that the main point in all religions of the whole world is simply one huge mistake. He's saying, when he, and he says, he goes on to say, when he became a Christian, he actually got a more open mind. Because he believed what Paul said here in his sermon to the Areopagus, that, that in verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. And he goes on to say, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. And if God really did make the whole world and everything in it and gave life and breath and everything else to all of the people in the world, then if we cannot find his fingerprints on a person's life or in a culture or in a community in which we live, then it's not because he's absent. It's because we're nearsighted. God is alive and active by his spirit in every community, amongst every people, in every culture. And our job is never to bring God somewhere. Our, God is, our, our job is to find him there and help people see where he already was. So there's a loving, dignifying method there that says I see God in you I see God's story here but you can have a loving method even in a loving moment and those could just be skills you develop and you use with unloving motivations some obvious unloving motivations for evangelism political domination I think we could all agree or I hope we can all agree. <laughs> if not, let's not talk after the service. Uh, I'm just, just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm open to discussion. Uh, send, send me an email. <laughs> oh, man. Another maybe uh, obviously unloving, unhealthy motivation is quotas and evangelistic accolades. Right? But I'm not too worried about that from this group of people. I'm more interested in us taking real stock of the more subtle, unloving motivations that might come up for us as we're sharing our faith. And those might be something like enjoying the thrill of a debate or more, enjoying the thrill of winning a debate. Maybe you actually, deep down, don't feel very secure in your faith and you need people to agree with you in order to feel more secure in your faith. And so, because you worry that you've got it all wrong, you need to either convince them for yourself or to exit the conversation altogether. Or maybe, that, maybe you're worried that you're not very smart or that people will think you're not very smart. And that if you engage in a conversation and the outcome is anything but you winning, they'll be right. Or you, you'll be right. Or maybe you grew up with the lie that you can only be close with people who agree with you. And so when the disagreement comes up, you have to squash it. Because you're actually worried about losing the relationship. 
Or maybe you just feel personally responsible for someone's soul and changing someone's mind in a way that only God is responsible for. Whatever the case may be, there, there are lots of very understandable, unloving motivations. And I say they're unloving because they're not about the person in front of you. They're actually about yourself. And, and when you have an unloving motivation, it comes out in your conversation. Uh, for those of you who like rhyming, I'm going to say that again. When you have an unloving motivation, it comes out in your conversation. So people might experience you as defensive or dogmatic, or if that's not your personality, as timid and waffling, like you don't really believe what you're saying. But if your motivation is love, if your motivation is love and you have the interior freedom to just be looking at the person in front of you and wanting what's best for them, then, then, then you will be free to be passionate rather than dogmatic. You'll be free to be confident rather than defensive. You, you'll be free to be humble rather than timid, nuanced instead of waffling. It, it, it's, it's subtle. It can come out in your tone or your face or your body language. But even if you choose the right words, if it's not coming from love, it isn't going to land. So we need to know how Paul shared his faith from a loving motivation. And I want to suggest that, that the primary loving motivation isn't even, I mean, as important as this is, isn't even love for the person sitting in front of you. It's our love for God. And, and, and then the reason I say that is because the person sitting in front of you may or may not hear you. We see that in, we see that in the story. There are some people who sneer at Paul. And there are some people who are like, what is this babbler talking about? And then there are others who are like, we want to hear you again. And then there are others yet who, who believe and follow Jesus along with him. There be all kinds of reactions. But if our primary and only motivation is compassion, we will run out of steam to love. But if our primary love is for God, and from our love for God comes a love for everything he created and every person he created, that's a love that won't run out. Here's what I'm talking about. In, in verse 16, as we mentioned before, Paul says, or, or the, Luke says about Paul, he was greatly distressed because the city was full of idols. In, in the Greek, the, that, that framing, that phrase is more like he was greatly distressed in his spirit. Like he had a, he, he had a conniption, as my mom would have said. You know, he was, he was just like racked with feeling because this city was full of idols. He was so deeply distressed that the God of the universe was not being praised, was not being worshipped, was not being understood, was not being related to, was not being received as God. How many of us, and I'm including myself here, pray hallowed be thy name, but we're not at all concerned when his name isn't hallowed, when his name isn't glorified or lifted up by our friends or our family or our community. How many of us pray that prayer that Jesus taught us, but we don't feel that deep distress in our spirits when we see idols being erected in the lives of our friends and the people that we love and by idols, I'm not talking, obviously, like little images. I'm talking about people putting in the place of God and desiring from things what they can only get from God. Essentially worshiping other things as, a ways, as ways to fulfill themselves. So, they get, so they, they, they're looking for their worth in romantic relationships rather than in God. How deeply distressed in our spirits are we when we say, hallowed be thy name, 
When, when, when a, a dear one to us is looking for validation in their career success rather than from God, how deeply distressed in our spirit are we or when they're looking for peace in weed rather than in God? How deeply distressed are we? And, and I'm, not t- I'm not talking selfishly angry. I'm talking, I'm talking genuinely sad and concerned. Or when they're looking for, for heaven in their dream of a safe quiet life in the right neighborhood rather than in God or or looking for safety and political victory rather than in God or looking for salvation by following the rules of their religion rather than in God how deeply distressed are we because the the level of our distress will be just about the same as our level of love for God and for our neighbor And I got to say this, as I was writing this, I, my, I, I, I feel deeply convicted by this myself. How distressed are we as people who say we love God when he's not loved? We struggle, if we're honest, I, I think, to love God this much or to love him consistently this much. If we're human. So, so how does Paul, where does Paul get this from? And, and how can we love God this much consistently? So that we will be deeply distressed in our spirits when we see that he is not loved. And that he is not being received with all of the, all of the worth, all of the validation, all of the peace and the heaven and the safety and security that he has to offer. We can do that by gazing upon, consistently gazing upon and reveling in his love for us. We can grow and deepen in our love of God by consistently gazing upon and reveling in God's love for us. There's no other way that I know to do this. Paul says, God marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands, and he did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not very far from any of us. Paul said, in the words of Willie James Jennings, that great theologian and biblical scholar, God desires those who desire idols. And that includes me. That includes you. That includes every human being that seeks to get from stuff what we can only get from God. And until we embrace this good news for ourselves, until we consistently are, are, are gazing on and reveling in the God who desires us, who desire idols, we will not be able to grow in the love of God that we need to share our faith from a genuinely loving motivation. But when we have that love, when we know that love, when we know that we don't need romantic relationships to give us our worth because God has given us our worth. We don't need our career success to validate us because God has said, well done, good and faithful servant. We don't need anything in life to give us peace outside of God because we have peace like a river, even in the midst of our suffering. Well, then we have the interior freedom to share from true love, to share without needing anything from the person sitting in front of us to fill us up or make us feel secure in the relationship or in our faith. We can share from love. And when we pair a deep love for God and a deep love of our neighbor with a truly loving method shared in a loving moment, then evangelism goes from being something that's not just not immoral, but is the most profoundly loving act you can ever engage in with another person. Let me pray for us. Dear Jesus, And I say, dear Jesus, 
because you are dear to us. Thank you for revealing to us a God who desires those who desire idols. Thank you that you are not a God who leaves us to our own devices, but you have come to us to show us what a life, a Godward life really looks like. To die so that the just judgment on all of our idol worship wouldn't fall on us. So we could live with you, live with our Father. God, I pray that you would impress upon each person here Again, whether whether they would consider themselves a Christian or not, that you desire them. And that even when we've turned away from you, you do not turn away from us. Even when we are willing to sacrifice our relationship with you in order to fulfill our own desires, you are willing to sacrifice yourself in order to fulfill us with a relationship with you. So God, we just say hallelujah this morning. Praise your name because you are a good God. We pray, God, that you would fill us with your spirit. That our motivation for sharing whenever we're given the opportunity to share would come from a pure love for you would come from a a pure love for our neighbor. God, we pray even now that you would start to work on and and winnow away anything in us that needs to get a result from a conversation. But fill us with your presence so that we know we have everything that we need so that we can truly love our neighbors and love the others here in this room that we share the good news with. Lord Jesus, we pray now that as we come to this moment of communion, that you truly would commune with us. Would you make these elements, this simple bread and cup, truly into your spiritual body and blood that we could take you into ourselves, that you would fill us and fulfill us. We worship you. We worship you, Jesus. And we pray that through us, your name would indeed be made holy. In Jesus' name, amen.